Yes. Hi everyone, I'm Pia. Uh, thank you for having me. Is it good? Sound good enough for the video? Or? Yeah, it's okay. Great. So I co-founder and CEO at Open Connected, and I'm going to be chatting today about yeah, building bridges between uh, the legacy and the decentralized ecosystem to fund public goods. Okay, so if you're only here for five minutes, this is what I want you to think about. Um, if we want to make philanthropy tech, which is what Open Connected does, for people who are already winners, then we continue like we are. But if we want to lift people out of poverty and co-design, co-create this technology with them, then we, we must bridge the legacy system and help people over. So essentially, if you're working on Web3 projects, which I think most of you are here, my plea today is to think about not only those who are winners of the current system, but also build technology for those who are um, the winners of the current system. And I'm going to tell you about it. Okay. Um, so this is the thought framework that I use when I think about uh, Web3 and what's happening today in the world. Essentially, um, what used to be no longer is, but the future is not here yet. Right? What will, will be is not fully here yet. So this is um, <coughs> what I mean about it. I use a framework called the Three Horizons framework when I think about developing technology and building technology. So the first horizon is what's happening today. Okay, we have a world in crisis, and any innovation that we build today for the status quo only sustains the status quo. Okay, but then we know that a lot in this world is changing, right? We are in this kind of transitional moment where things, the future that we want to see is not fully here, but the legacy system no longer applies, it no longer represents the society that we have today, and so we are in this middle of this turbulent transition, right? Where we can see that there is a space to build disruptive innovation. We can see that a lot of technology can be built. We identify new opportunities, but there's a huge risk, right? Is that the risk that we face is that unless we are thinking about um, regenerative culture, unless we're thinking about transformative innovation, we have a risk. And the risk is we're just gonna make people who are rich richer. And that's a big risk that the Web3 um, ecosystem faces today, right? Because unless we are bringing people over, we are co-designing technology with those who are being left out of the current system, then we're just doing the same but with different technology. We're building for the same people, right? We need to keep a vision of uh, a purpose, a vision of a long-term future, a radical narrative for the system that we want to see and we want to see in the world. So this is how we think about um, Open Collective. We have the old ways today, what we call the legacy system, but we have the future that we want, but it's not fully here yet. And so Open Collective is acting like a bridge between these two systems. So let me explain a little bit about what Open Collective um, is. So, Open Collective, we've been sustaining decentralized communities since 2016. But we've been doing it not with a DAO, we've been doing it in fiat. Right? So, what is Open Collective? Open Collective is a platform that enables decentralized communities to fundraise, manage, and spend money collectively without needing to create a legal entity or have a bank account to do it, right? So we essentially think about open source technology, for example. The open source ecosystem today sustains most of um, the technology that all the companies are using today. Any company out there uses open source in their stuff, right? Any company. But open source technology is built by, by people that are totally decentralized. They're, they don't, they're not um, organized in a legal entity, right? Somewhere in the 
the US, someone here in Barcelona, someone in Nigeria, right? And they come together online and they build technology that all of these companies are using in their own stack. These companies are making money off this technology, of this open source technology. And many of them want to give back to the communities <coughs> for several reasons, right? Because they want the technology to be developed, because they want to hire um, developers who understand these technologies, because they're good citizens, good corporate citizens. Oh, I know it's rare, but it happens. And so let's say Google wants to give money to projects working on Chromium. They turn around and they're like, I want to give them money. What are they going to do? They're going to send $5,000, $10,000, $20,000. $20, to whom? To a PayPal account of the developer? Like that's impossible, right? And that's where Open Collective comes in. Open Collective kind of creates this legal, admin, and financial infrastructure for decentralized communities to have access to money. So essentially, this open source project can now become a collective and receive funding, manage funding, pay themselves through Open Collective, right? So we give them a platform to organize, we give them a platform to fundraise, and we do that on like a global network. No? Okay. So <clears throat> Open Collective created this open finance platform and network of 245 nonprofits around the world. These nonprofits are the custodians of the funds of these collectives. Right, we currently have 15,000 communities on the platform raising money through 245 legal entities. Right, so what, instead of saying we are just going to let everyone manage crypto, for example, which is a very viable solution for decentralized communities, we said that we, we need to connect all of these decentralized communities to the legacy system, and we're going to do it in fiat. So we created a platform and a network of fiscal codes. So another example, if you are a mutual aid or a mutual aid group, right? You're pooling money together for a cost. You're pooling money together for your community. It's overkill to think that you're gonna create a foundation, a nonprofit, a legal entity. Where are you gonna do it? You're decentralized. Which, you know, the, 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 the economic and financial system still operates in a territorial space, right? The system that we have is designed for corporations that operate in a scarcity driven economy. But the, the decentralized communities, these groups that want to fundraise, they're not in a territory. They're all over the world. So where are you going to set up your legal entity? Who's going to be the president of that legal entity? It's like asking who's the president of the internet. Just continue. Right? So if you're a group of people that want to manage money in full transparency, you can do it in crypto, but you can also do it in open collective. And the thing here is that the cryptos, the Web3 ecosystem, it's not really there yet for everyone to take full advantage of it, right? And so all of these groups, these grassroots communities, these grassroots movements around the world, they need a solution to be able to fundraise and manage money transparently. And that's what, that's what we do here. So, it all started with the need to fund open source projects. Okay, so open, open source is very close to uh, my heart, and I'm a big believer in, in open source. When I started, I co-founded an Argentina political party called the Net Party, so that is like, you know, side story. But what we did with um, the Net Party or Partido La Red is we built an open source um, tool at the center of the political party that was a decision-making uh, platform, right? It's designed for citizens to be able to vote. We did it open source, this was like, 12 years ago. We did it open source because I don't know, we didn't know how to do things differently. But the beauty of having, having it done um, open source was that it was used in 30 different countries around the world and we weren't even involved. It was translated to all of these languages. It was used in Tunisia, in Mexico, in, um, in the United States, in Nigeria, everywhere. So open source for me is the way I understand how to operate in the world. And I read this quote uh, not long ago, and I love it. It said, the original ethos of the web is a desire not only to idly exist within the world, but also to take part in its collective creation. And that's what we did with open source. So funding open source for us was like our first vision. And you know, there are few things in the world that embody this idea of collectively creating something in a permission, permissionless way, like open source. 
and that's how we start. Um, open source has a couple of attributes that make it really difficult to fund in particular. It's a non excludable public good, so it's not scarce. Once you build tech and you release it into the world, you cannot control who access it. You know, who access it is. It's open source. And there is no marginal cost for other person to use the code. Your code is out there. Anyone can use it. Someone else using it doesn't make it more expensive, right? So there's no extra cost for the user for using open source. So it's very difficult to fund something with these attributes. But open source software is not free. Someone else is paying for it. And it's normally maintainers with their time. Time away from their families, you know, time away from um, health care <laughs> activities that coding and all those green squares in GitHub, right? So someone else is, is paying for that code. It's not free, the maintainers are, are building it. And so we wanted to make sure that money like, went into the hands of maintainers. The open source ecosystem has this like, deeply rooted imbalances at its core. Posting an issue has zero cost. For anyone here who's a developer, you know that posting an issue in GitHub for you takes like two seconds. A zero cost. You don't have to pay for it. Companies are cooked on open source. Of course, it's free. Right? You build your company, you don't have to invest in a, in you know, in technology, you just are up and running with close to zero cost. Like no one is going back from open source. Like the cultural battle of open source has already been won a while back. There are more people extracting value from a repo than those maintaining it. So a lot more people, a lot more um, users use software than build it. You share the code, but you do not share the responsibility, right? So you build code, you release it into the world, and the code is there. But if something you know bad happens with that code, if that code breaks, like the responsibility is yours. Like trust me, angry users on GitHub, not easy. It's easy to start a project, it's very difficult to do it. Right? Once you have um, an open source um, a project that's been used in like six million applications around the world, trust me, you feel like you need to maintain it for free. Right? And but there's like, this massive pain point in the open source world that is that the formal like contracts and partnership agreements, they, they just do not happen like they happen in the business world, right? No one has a legal entity, no one has a company, right? It's, it's, it's just a completely different language. I don't know if you know Swift on security, but if you don't follow them on, on, on GitHub, I, I truly, on um, Twitter, I, I really recommend them. Um, he works on Microsoft and he says, like, I'm convinced that many developers have no freaking idea how business actually works and what operations department have to go through to make things happen. Enrolling a new vendor is more than difficult, it's demoralizing. It eats your soul. If you make it easy, you are a god. Right? So, again, Microsoft wants to fund open source. They need to convince their procurement department. You need to enroll as a vendor. No one's going to do it. But we need to fund this community. Right? So, like a huge pain point. And that's kind of what we built. We built Open Collective to be able to fund all of these decentralized groups through the Open Collective platform that connects to this network of nonprofits around the world. The nonprofits take care of the reporting, they talk to the legacy system, they understand the world that still operates today. But what we're doing is we're, fa we're facilitating project-directed funding to all of these groups, right? Because we need these, these are the groups that are building the technology that we are all using. It's unfair that we don't fund them. And yes, Open Collective will go through the vendor process. That looks like this. I'm not. Okay, so we are currently funding, we funded to date about, this is, I think this is now $32 million in project directed funding to, um, oh yes, this is not the updated presentation. Anyway. 32 million to close to um, 3.5 thousand open source projects, right? And this is just the open source ecosystem. Hello. Welcome. We are now funding multiple public goods, commons, grassroots community.
communities, social, political movements. Again, the organizations of this new world, these decentralized groups, we found this, we built this way to fund them without making them into legal entities, without forcing them into bank account, into having bank accounts. So we fund the solidarity economy movement. So we have about 500 mutual aid groups just in the US only. And these are grassroots communities, <coughs> right? Um, climate justice, global movements, um, civic participation projects. Uh, this is this is not updated. It's now 93 million dollars that we, we funded to 15,000 um, communities around the world. But we've been really shifting moving money from the center to the fringes. We've been um, moving money from organizations, companies, uh, foundations, donor advice funds, funds, venture funds to decentralized communities that can now make a living out of their, their work. And our approach to sustainability has to do with grassroots cultures of governance and tech. So it's really this mixture of one of the main kind of um, hitting points that I see in the Web3 ecosystem has to do with governance. And it's very, um, it's a sticky subject, but a lot of DAOs like, have governance issues, right? I'm not saying anything. And I think that we can look into how grassroots movements have traditionally solved governance um, issues, and we can support them with uh, technology to help these decentralized groups. Um, this is how we define sustainability. Sustainability refers to the resilience and the thriving of projects, the communities, and the individuals that surround them. So it's not just about funding addresses or having addresses voting or participating, it's about the humans behind those addresses. That's kind of the, the approach that we have. It's about resilience. Um, so in the past 12 months, we paid out uh, $23 million for uh, community members, right? They're making a living. And this is kind of what I was trying to say at the very beginning in the Three Horizons framework. These are folks that need pay stubs. These are folks that need to prove proof of income, right? And so, for me, this is this is key. This is what I'm, I'm trying to say. I was trying to say before about uh, involving people who are not the winners of the current system. If we're gonna, if you, okay, part of the issue that I see with Web three, and I'm a big fan, right? But part of the issue that I see is that. You, it's not connected to the legacy world. We still haven't figured out a way of employing people in a, in a way that governments understand, right? If you're renting and you need to show your uh, landlord proof of income and you are making your living out of a DAO, that is a very difficult proposition, right? And so what we need to make sure is that we build these tools to incorporate folks that today need these things, otherwise, you know, we can just make DAOs for people who do not need to prove income, or who don't need mortgages, or you know, because they have enough money. But that is that's not what we want. We want this transformative technology, right? And so in order to do that, we need to build in this really boring legal stuff into our DAOs. And it's not easy to do, right? We we couldn't do it. Like we open collective tried to do it um, when we started. And we couldn't do it, we couldn't figure out how to fix this problem and so that's why we ended up with a solution that is like fully fiat. But I, I think that we need to build these bridges, we need to incorporate, like to um, make these two technologies talk to each other more. So we can, can we bridge, how, so how do we do it, right? We need, these are things that we know all of these 15,000 grassroots decentralized communities need invoices, right? Because they, 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 they want, companies want to fund them, companies need an invoice. They're not gonna just give money to someone and say like, okay, I don't need an invoice, it's okay, it's a gift. Like companies do not do that. As much as we want, like companies do not make gifts to one another. Like the donation, like it doesn't operate like that, unfortunately. And so we need tax deductibility. Right? There's a lot of people who want to support 
decentralized community. So I'm the governor. Can I get my tax at all receipt? Like, what is that DAO going to do? What are we going to give them, right? Pay stuff, insurance, you know, benefits, employment. These are the things that the, the folks, the, the, the members, the individuals inside these communities need. And we need to figure out a path to provide that this to them. Do you think that the solution is technological? Because isn't it like legal? And isn't it coming from the lack of um, willingness from governments and organizations to actually solve these problems? I think that's a good question. I don't think the solution is technological. I think this, the challenges are human, and I, I agree that they are legal and admin. And that's why Open Collective at the core is like legal and admin and financial solution for these communities because. That is, I don't think that we can sit around and wait for, for governments to say like, okay, we're going to accept crypto as like, you know, a legal tender, and uh, if you get paid in crypto by your DAO, we're going to, you know, let you file your income taxes like that, and you know, we'll accept it as your proof of income. I think we need to figure out a solution around governments. So, you know, there's. In my mind, there's three ways of changing, of achieving systemic change, right? Like really systems changing, like tectonic, you know, changes. One of them is revolution, right? You're like, okay, we're just gonna throw everything out in the streets, but then all bets are off, right? Um, no one knows what's gonna happen, but that that is a path for a systemic change, a revolution. The other path is that we're gonna change the system from within. Right? We're gonna go in there, we're gonna win elections, we're gonna lobby Congress, we're gonna, you know, uh, be part of the process, and then, you know, one day maybe we'll, we'll get there. The third one is like building around the system, which is like, you know, uh, but Mr. Fuller like explains this in, in a beautiful way. He says, you'll never change reality by fighting it. What you need to do is build a new system that makes the old system obsolete, right? And I think that that's kind of the right path, or the, in my mind, that's the best path forward. So what can we build around existing systems that kind of propel us forward, right? Um, and that's kind of what I'm looking for. Um, but I agree, I think it's, an, it's a legal and admin and financial and human issue. I think technology has to help um, but it's, you know, better DAOs are not gonna, or, I mean, there's no consensus mechanism that is gonna solve your community if the governance is not right, essentially. Um, so what is the trade-off? In our model, in the Open Collective model, there's a huge trade-off that I'm very aware of, and I'm not a fan of, to be honest. I need it to, you know, um, commit or, or, you know, I, I needed to make this um, trade off. There's a power dynamic with existing legal entities. All of these decentralized communities, they are, you know, it's not, not your keys, not your money. That's what happens here, right? Because the money is not in the hands of the decentralized communities. It's like sitting in the bank account of a legal entity that gives these communities their fiscal status. Right. So in our model, inherently, there is like a power dynamic that happens with existing legal entities. I just want to call that out because it's uh, it is what it is. So, but we we want to offer a bridge from legacy systems to the house. We want to co-create and co-design philanthropy tech with the grassroots culture and low tech solutions. Again. The grassroots communities that need us the most are grassroots communities for whom PayPal is an issue, right? And so if we're here talking like multi-sigs in MetaMask, we're not getting to them, right? We need to make sure that we bridge this with a solution that is accessible for those who we are. We tell ourselves we're building a new world. Anyway, a few, I don't know 
why they just kind of take that into the stuff. Sorry. <laughs> Forget about that. Should have checked with them. So a couple of examples of like how these bridges are, are happening. All for climate is um, a um, climate so uh, climate justice initiative. And they have like both things. They have a DAO, um, and they, they they also have a collective, right? So all for climate is like used to bridge grassroots citizens with old school foundations donating in fiat, and then some of that money goes into a DAO that is managed by the Regions Unite um, group. Okay, so it's like again we can kind of merge these two things to create something that works for more people. That's the goal here. We also did fund OSS with the Bitcoin folks. Um, we did a quadratic um, funding. We called it democratic funding because quadratic funding was just too difficult for mm -hmm. folks to understand. But you know, it's a quadratic funding mechanism to fund open source. Right? Um, Okay, so pay attention here, please. Democratizing, because I know that DAOs and the whole Web3 ethos is about democratizing access and democratizing a lot of things. But democratizing is not just about opening access, it's about open access and shared and participatory governance. Right, so the governance piece of uh, decentralized communities is um, it's key. And this is what we're doing with B2C, okay? So I am very aware, um, Open Collective is a, is a company that develops a platform that is open source, obviously, and it's a network of legal entities, but the company has venture funding, right? It was opened in Delaware, it's a, as awful as it gets, right? That's the company that I created. So, but we're, we're kind of stuck down, right? Because when we started in 2015, um, I don't know, we didn't, we didn't have another option, or we didn't not know how to do things in a different way. So we opened a C Corp in Delaware, we went asking for money, we got a couple of investors and funds to put money into the company, um, and then we built Open Collective. But now, what do we do, right? Because Open Collective, so my, I have a 50 year view of like, anything that I do, um, and so, I believe that the problem that we solve, that decentralized communities need access to funding, is true today and it's gonna be true in 50 years. But I'm 40, right? I'm not gonna be around in 50 years to live this. So how do we, what do we do? How do we move forward? How do I ensure that Open Collective's mission is safeguarded for the future, right? Because what's, as, a, as a startup founder, what are my options? I can sell the company, when I, I, I'm tired of doing this. But then nothing guarantees that the new company is gonna give our mission. If not, look at GitHub and Microsoft, right? Or any other countless examples. Um, I can put Open Collective on a path to an IPO and go public, but that's not the path I mean. I don't want to hyper grow Open Collective or grow at any cost. That's not who I am or what I want for the community that I built. So where, what do we do, right? I, I'm kind of running out of options. And so what we're doing is something called E2C, which is exit to community. Right? We're gonna sell Open Collective to the community that it serves. You know what exit to community is because many DAOs have exit to community, but I don't want addresses to own <laughs> Open Collective. I want people to own Open Collective, right? And so what we are doing is we are building a trust and the goal of the trust, the purpose of the trust is to safeguard the mission of Open Collective. And then this, that trust is gonna own the shares of Open Collective in the name of the, the community. It's gonna have like a community governance. And maybe there's a law on top of that, you know, to manage some of that governance. I don't know. But the goal is that the trust will safeguard Open Collective. So that's the path that we're in. Um, and the challenges did not change with the changes in technology, right? Like, they are the same, participation is, is hard. And I think that if any of you have DAOs, you know that when you launch a DAO, you have, 
like any other project, you have a lot of participation at the beginning, and then it kind of, you know, um, it starts decreasing. It's very hard to keep momentum. It's very hard to keep participation um, happening. I am not a fan of airdrops either because of this, um, because a lot of airdrops people start participating in the hopes of getting like tokens in the airdrop, but then they start like you know once you do that then they don't participate in the community anymore. And what you need is like constant participation. Um, so I think that democratic culture is upstream of democratic institutions. So the approach here is, if you have, um, if you want to build a DAO, if you want to build a community, a decentralized community that is um, resilient, that is sustainable, you need to start with thinking of democratic culture. You need to think about how you're gonna embed like democracy in your in the culture of your group, and that when you have that, then you end up having like democratic institutions, you end up having a governance. And I think that the first step for that, again, is co-designing, co-creating whatever technology you are building with the folks that you are supposedly building this technology for. Right? And that's, that's hard, but that's the way to do it. So don't sleep on culture. If culture and the humanity gets away from you, then like no consensus mechanism is gonna save your community. Right, don't forget about that. And also specifically do not forget about some humans, right? Those who can you know, whenever we build something in open collective, we we try to reach out to the folks who are most marginalized in our communities because those are the ones who can see the biases in your technology first, because they suffer then firsthand. They are the ones who can call calls and say that no, look, you're doing this, but like it has these consequences, right? Um, so have a conversation, have an honest conversation uh, about what are the externalities of the technology that you're building, um, and incorporate them. Incorporate those people in your uh, in your design process. Yeah, the people closest to the pain must be the people. So um, we were baking grassroots governance culture in Open Collective like at every step of the way. We have a solidarity school. We do learning in public. Um, whenever we release a feature, we start with a very open process of, uh, sorry, when we start building a feature, we start with an open process of co-design and co-creation. Um, we have whistleblower policies. Do you have whistleblower policies in your DAOs? Do you think about conflict resolution? Do you think about an ethical framework? Like it's not just about tech. It's it's about the human aspect of, of your DAOs. Context setting. Um, anyway. um, you know what are this is the type of things that we're doing to foster democratic culture because we believe that that's gonna result in like a B2C that is going to be democratic as well. Okay, so I'm wrapping up. And then we can go to questions. Recap. Democratic culture is upstream of democratic institutions. Sustainability is about communities and individuals, not addresses. We are in a transition horizon. It's messy. It's really, it's unclear what we're going to end up having. But we need to be informed by long-term perspective, like what do we want to build, for whom, and then bring them into the design today. Otherwise, we're doing shiny tech for the same people. Be balanced and provide opportunities to bridge systems. Governance is hard, so build sandboxes, play around in sandboxes of innovation, and be radically honest about the negative externalities. I think that's it. That's it. And so you believe that Web3 could help to solve the mission on which you are going, yes or no? And if yes, then are you actually building some Web3 tools and products and stuff uh, in, in, in your daily uh, I think Web3 is pointing at the world that we want to see in the world, right? 
Um, and what I what I want to do is to bring it closer to the world that we have today, or take the people today closer to Web three. Right? And for that, I think that we need to first fund these decentralized communities of folk and grassroots movement for people that cannot have access to funding otherwise. Right? So that's what we're doing. I think Web three for us is. Um, Amazing tech because it has the, in my mind, it has the potential of coordinating funding public goods at a scale that is only comparable to what nation states are able to do today. Right? That's what I think Web3 can do. I think that in order to get there, we need to build and design a lot of governance, technology, processes, and communities. Uh, we need to do it with the folks who we are funding public goods for. Right? And so we are in Open Collective is not actively doing anything for Web3 at the moment in terms of, I mean, I, I have, I, I would want to do that. We have. I don't know, we work with like Radical, for example, to see if there's an option for the Radical kind of developers that are making money um, in Radical to be able to be, have like proper employment to open. We employ a lot of developers in Radical, right? We employ a lot of containers and developers and, and organizers. And so I guess what we want to do is to give Web3 the admin tooling that connects it to the legacy system. Okay. Yeah. So Does that make sense? Yeah, so, uh, just to summarize, yes. to make sure, you're not building Web3 tools right now. No. You probably eventually do it. Uh... I probably won't do it from Open Collective. Okay. I would much rather collaborate, connect with other projects already doing it. I don't think we need to build it all ourselves. I think that the way we do Open Collective, the way we build the stack and the platform, is if we have a, a, a very robust open API um, for others to build stuff. So for example, Metagog, you know Metagog? Metagog is like a, a governance gateway for DAOs, right? And Metagog connects to Open Collective to execute on payments that are decided on DAOs, for example, right? But we didn't build that. We just opened Open Collective for others to build. Yeah, that's very likely going to be the model. Hey, great to meet you. I'm Nicolò from Rome. I think we share the same city, Italy. Uh, so. I, I'm, I'm from Buenos Aires, but my daughter's name is Roma. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually, I'm a CTO of a Web3 company, which name is Printify, uh, and we do Web3 integration. So, my question is uh, how does the funding process work? And if you uh, take some equity from the company, or if you are available to, to share some knowledge and to integrate uh, our company? Yeah, so um, the funding is for communities, so we do not fund companies. So Open Collective is a company. We're trying to get away from that, but as I said, it's, like, it's not easy. Um, but we fund communities, we do not fund companies, so we don't take any equity on, on, on this kind of community. There's no equity. Um, so the way it works is, for example, um, companies or foundations or banks or whatever want to give money to these movements or grassroots communities and they can't give it to them because they're, they're not an entity so they give it to one of our 200 nonprofits. we hold the money on behalf of the communities and then we either deploy the folks from that community we reimburse them for you know if for example this meetup was a collective and would be spending money on this space tonight they would submit the invoice get reimbursed for this for example um, or they submit an invoice and they act as contractors. That's what it works. It's boring, it's like legal boring stuff. Not so much to uh, hi. Uh, there's around seven women in this room, and this is back to my question, including you. And um, maybe you will help me to navigate the question because it uh, lies with your strategy and stuff like that. 
Um, I was puzzled, I was just for fun doing uh, diversity, small research for the privacy market in the tree. And I found some, it's in US, it's called dark patterns for diversity, and it goes for minorities as well because they're excluded. When a company transitions from the to foundation or a DAO, somehow the responsibility, public responsibility for the team disappears. Like there's a local art on project that has fucking millions of treasury and it's impossible to find their team. I'm not saying only women, like there's no team. Because they pretend to be transparent, democracy, freedom, bullshit. Um, so, um, and I was, uh, there was a certain buzz in Twitter yesterday around the Ethereum Foundation, when there was a photo, shared photo of their core developers, just one woman, yeah, within the group. So if you go this publicly, you will be criticized. So I was thinking of how we would even approach uh, diversity and inclusion practice within the DAOs or decentralized organization when it's kind of like community based. So like everyone could come and join, uh, but then uh, you go to any crypto conference and there will be 90% of men. And you analyze projects, 90% of men. And you analyze the power structures, the worse. How we would it approach diversity or inclusion in this sense for from decentralized perspective? Like when there's kind of like foundation and the other teams, like in your uh, situation, that you don't control basically their policies and practices. Yes. I don't know how to answer that either. Like, I mean, I have, you know, I did, I did Y Combinator um, with the, my previous um, project, and I was always joking that I had all the all the minority tax because I was a woman from Argentina and uh, non-profit, uh, so I think I was the only one there. Um, and I don't think it has evolved so much since then. Um, I don't know. I it's it's tough. I guess. The one thing that has got free that I think can help um, is that you have like pseudonyms or like you, you have your address and you have, and I've seen many women that I know in the reverse that, and this is awful, but this happens, that they have um, a, like a guy's name on GitHub because like they get answered, uh, they, they, they don't get enough their code gets like merged, right? Otherwise, it just won't. Um, so I don't think it's a problem of Web3 only. I think that Web3 was supposedly doing this better, and I think we're in the same situation, right? Um, it's as awful as Web2 uh, tech. And I guess that just supports what I'm trying to say, right? If we just, if we just focus on the new technology, but we never include others that are not, you know, the winners of, of the previous technology. We're just doing different technology for the same people. And that angers me a little bit. But I don't think, other than being here today as like a female founder, CEO of a tech company that is profitable and, you know, employs women and minority um, groups, Around the world, other than that, I don't know what else to do. You know, it doesn't give me anything, I guess. Uh, hi, uh, Adrian, thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, just wanted to make a point uh, on the fact that I think um, what you're doing is uh, to bank, DM bank in the non Web3 space, I think, okay. right? So. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that from you. <laughs> and uh, so also one thing uh, I was thinking about recently was that, you know, you go about banking then bank with wallets and uh, banking with the banks with multi six is basically banking the end banks organization, right? So it's sort of like building the loop like uh, to another level. So that's where you match yourselves right now is at this multi six. So um, that's why um, 
the facility matches to that um, parallel against. Um, yeah, I. One thing, yeah, I didn't have clear is that if 100% of the organizations you work with uh, have no legal status, is that is that correct? Like they don't have, they're not an association, they're not. They, if if they if they do get this status at some point after working with you, let's say managing all the funds and so on, then they have to uh, sign off, or does it work? So, so if, if they start as a, so for example, an example in open source is Gatsby. Gatsby, uh, JS, is, is a, um, um, an open source uh, technology that started as a collective, right? And they were funded by um, multiple companies, the open collective, and then they grew into their own thing, and then they went and they raised money and they created a company, right, around Gatsby. Um, at that point, they stopped being a collective, right? What I really like about Open Collective is that you can start in one day, you can be up and running and raising funds, but it's as easy to create a collective as it is to close one, right? Which is, when you start a company or you start an association, it's harder to close it down than to open it, right? Because of how it, and it's expensive to close down a foundation or an association or a company, right? It's, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, a collective is just open and then you close it. That's it, it's very straightforward. So one example, when COVID started, we had this project called One K Project. Um, and we raised money and we gave $1,000 per month for three months to four families that you know, either they lost their job or workers on hospitality or artists. So, um, and then after kind of the pandemic started, you know, um, I don't know, decreasing whatever. The collective was closed down. That was it. And then the war in Ukraine happened. And in two seconds, I think you know, in one day, we restarted that collective and called one page project and we sent over nine million dollars in one thousand dollars per family to families in Ukraine. Right? And it took nothing, two seconds, and we started raising money. So what is really interesting about collectives is that you can think of them as like sandboxes, you can test an idea, and if you see that it has traction, it doesn't cost you anything, right? And if you see that it has traction and your community starts building and you want to be something in your own right, that's it, you can go. You know, you create your own company, you close your collective. Open Collective, the platform is free for um, collectives that want to, um, that are like self hosted right? So if you're a collective, you create your entity, and you're like, okay, I'm managing my own money, I don't need any of your calls, it's free. And you can keep your collective at all the history, at all the transactions, and just move it over. Right? So you can keep using the platform, you just don't use all the legal admin um, employment and other services that you pay us. So if I want to open one tomorrow, like, it will take like 24 hours or something? Yeah. And we have, we're opening a foundation here in Spain, um, and we have one in Europe, so we could be hosting in Europe. Um, thank you for talk. Uh, one moment was like most uh, like aligned to me when you told about landlord to ask what to open camp. I'm in free since 2016. <laughs> Uh, so there's a huge problem. I can move to Barcelona. <laughs> I have no success for rent a flat. I want to promote you to it, but like, for some other people, we've got the same problem. But I still didn't manage that. So this is a problem like that. Uh, so um, even after full talk, I was like precise as possible. Uh, I didn't get, are you offering to like uh, provide? Uh, some way to earn money for someone who don't want to manage all legal stuff. Is it legal? <laughs> I mean, so what? Uh, okay, um, and the worst like case what you can imagine. I just like I haven't um, education. Where I didn't have any traction. I'm a Russian in a, um, without any work permit in Europe. 
So I am a developer, I can kind of use this account and I can earn money in Europe with you. So you're collecting, right? It means you need to have a community. If you're not working with individual developers, right? If you have an open source project and that open source project has this sponsorship agreement with one of our nonprofits, and you are a member of that community, right? We hold money for your community, so you get donors, for example, that want to support you. They give money to our nonprofit, and then we call that money for your project. You can submit invoices against against that money and get paid with a proper invoice. But if you were in the US, for example, we would file what is called 1099, which is the um, proof of income. But we file 1099s in the US for thousands, thousands of developers, like thousands of developers. Okay, uh, and after all of that. Uh, what kind of like issues are you facing with the web free and legalizing? I mean, with some like governments such as like Thailand or who mm -hmm. more of welcome for web free and web free No, we don't have we don't have the out of web free or anything like that. We don't open collective is it's it's like a DAO but in the C as well. No, no, no. I mean I, I believe that the future then crypto one hundred percent legal thing for all of the world and cetera, but mm, for now it's not here yet. Uh, and I'm really uh, curious about what kind of issues are you facing? You face uh, during attempt to meet uh, that free and legal because I I I've been trying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. Um, so we, because we create and operate a lot of nonprofits that are in different countries, right? That are charities. So we need to abide by the regulations of those countries, and most of the time, those countries do not accept nonprofits coming to them. So, for example, our U.S. entity that is a public charity. The Open Collective Foundation um, is highly regulated because it's a 501c3, which is in the US is like the status of a foundation um, or a public charity. It, it, it has a, a very large budget. Um, and we are in California that is hyper regulated for our profits. They are the only thing we can do is have like a Gemini account, right? An account in Gemini that is in the custodian. And then if you want to give crypto to a collective, we have to immediately convert it to fiat and then we add it to the collective in fiat. Right? So that's the only thing that we do. Because other than that, it gets it gets complicated. Right? First of all, thank you for the speech. It's refreshing to hear some more realism. <laughs> especially when it comes to organization and democracy or how to govern. Um, I am curious, it sounds like we are in the process of sort of decentralizing, decentralizing the organization. Yeah. Your company mentioned there's a essentially a trust. I'm curious, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about sort of um, how you've been thinking of how to move forward from that because that's kind of the problem that any DAO has. Like, who would like support of uh, representatives?
the community ownership cannot be the end of the process. It has to be the beginning of the process, essentially. And so how do you do that? You do that by, by deciding those things with the community that you are serving, that you want to be ownership of your project. So we have, I don't know, it's, it's a lot of, it's almost like political work, yeah. right? Like we are approaching this almost like, yes, very politically. So yeah, we have yeah. learning, yeah, yeah, exactly. We have like learning in public, kind of, we did like this podcast documentary. We have um, like sessions with different groups. And it's a very kind of curated and super heavy process. But I'm, I'm you know, at the end of that, I want to have those answers. But it's not the beginning, it's the end of the process for us. Um, I, talk, I know Kevin Paul is on Bitcoin, he's a good friend of mine, we talk about this a lot. And he did it the other way around. He's like, we're gonna give up whatever situation. And so they're like, okay, after they exited Bitcoin to the community, and now he's running things like, like frantically very super out, like proper governments and writing papers and all of that. I want open directly to do the opposite. Um, so, I, I, I don't know what the end of the process is going to look like. I want to protect the mission of Open Directive, I want to protect the company, I want to protect my employees. I like have a, you know, a group of people that have been working non-stop for the past seven years to make you know, Open Directive to where it is today. Um, and I know I want to protect them as well. So, the way I'm thinking it is almost like concentric circle. I, my, my first circle is my team, the Open Directive. Staff and employees and, and the, the, the non profits and their staff, and then we kind of keep growing out, like a, you know, to the outer edges of the community. But that's how we're thinking about building. So, the first group that's going to be working on governance, we're going to be super close to the company and, and the team running things. And then from there, we're going to start opening and growing. And it's going to be a long process, it's going to be a super big. But you're welcome to say no. I mean, it can be interesting. Yeah. It's like It's exactly. It's like forming that. Yeah. But it's worth it, right? Because I spend a lot of time and, and, and effort and building something that I think should outlive. Like I think a successful mission should outlive its audience, right? And that's like I work every day to make myself be that successful. Like the day I can fire myself, I'm mm -hmm. so happy. That's, that's what I work towards, right? But well, I need, you know, we need to build towards that. Yeah. I have another question from someone else. Yeah. I'm kind of curious uh, from sort of bottom to top, like, let's say there's an open source library or some cryptography that needs to work on, right? Um, and you're just a random person competing on GitHub. How do you then go from there to, like, you would say that, like, who decides who should get paid yeah. what, right? Yeah. Does, let's say, who will get the money before the people invoice, or how does that sort of yeah. like workflow process? So, um, so the first thing is that you you need to, so you have an open source project, right, and, and you're working on that. You need to have, um, you need to be one of the owners, or at least have, like, one of the rights. On that open source project, and be able to apply to open directive, uh, open source directive for funding, right? Um, you need to be a community member, and so we have we check for like public history, right? Um, we check for um, how many uh, contributors that people have and things like that. Okay, so now we've accepted, you know, this uh, project. Um, we have like about you know three thousand five hundred projects, so. We and Google gives money to the open source collective, which is to run our nonprofits, for you, for your project. It's your mark for you. The open collective platform, you can just, I can show you, the open collective platform is transparent, and so we allocate money to your collective. So you have a budget now that is transparent. Anyone can see how much money your project has. And then you're a contributor to that project, and you want to get paid because you spend time building that technology. And so you just have an invoice to your collective. We don't even see it until the, the admins of the collective, the folks who created the collective are applied, approach it. Yes. If it's not approved by the committee, I don't even see it. Like, you know, we have, we have 
got so much like scam and fraud on the platform. Otherwise, like, but we don't even see it doesn't even go up for us. Once it's approved, um, then the, the non-profit, the fiscal host, um, looks for compliance issues, right? So they look at um, you submitted an invoice that makes sense, right? That is not uh, a picture of a selfie. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then once we check for compliance, um, we we check for that we have like automated tax forms on the platform and things like that. So we send you a tax form request if it's over around six hundred dollars per month, right? Because you need to you need to file an income for like seventeen hundred. Once you, you send that, um, we pay it. And we pay about 50 times a week. And so companies give you like money into a pool or they yes. fund the individual project? Both. Okay. We have open source funds. So, for example, with Chrome, we have, I think now it's like a $2 million fund or something like that to fund Chrome new development work, right? And so we create the fund, and from there, we give money to many different projects. Or sometimes, um, you know, a company like uh, Airbnb is like, hey, we use Webpack, you know, we're going to give money to Webpack. So they go into the Webpack collective and we put money there. Um, and we have funds in our foundation, for example, we, we fund Ukraine Freedom, we do a lot of Ukraine Freedom and, and data rights projects. Um, so those are all funds that we kind of articulate, right? So we fund, um, you know, deployment of VPNs, uh, like Raspberry Pi VPNs in like countries that you know have internet, uh, government controlled internet. We you know we fund I don't know, a lot of work like that. We do we fund a lot of research um, in government control, like government um, censorship. We fund circumvention projects, right, to kind of move around censorship. Um, so we do that. With funds, so we create these funds, and from there we fund data uh, infrastructure, data. So both models: we have project directly funding, or we have like funds at that level. First, uh, first a quick take: don't use bank down banks or them because this is going to also work risky. Okay, fine. Don't go there. Uh, but I said you put all my money in sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're turning to the ethics that you mentioned, and I guess ethics were created as a response in a way to prevent uh, fraud and stuff like that. And not, I mean, there's just a few people who start the organization with really ethics on front. So uh, when you collaborate with so many different projects and you can't control them, uh, how do you track that they are in line with your ethics first and second with a certain code of trust beyond um, maybe these like financial relations mm -hmm. and compliance because I mean it could be manipulated, but I'm more saying on how you Mm, assure that a certain entity, I know in Africa, uh, is not just decolonizing you in a way, uh, but in a fraudulent way. Why yeah. I've seen lots of this in blockchain when I, I could really imagine this like 20 people sitting in a meetup and they're all paying for one dollar, but this ecosystem are paying thousands because oh, we have this blockchain in, in Kenya event, and suddenly yeah. this is cool. So how do you, what kind of, first of all, your internal protection, and second, what kind of watchdogs you have inside that kind of are broader than just your centralized view and control? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we have like compliance done at different levels, right? So in the meetup case, like there's there's one la layer that has to do with the with the nonprofit network, right? So we have like two hundred and forty seven nonprofits that they do a lot of the kind of first line of compliance. So if um so because it's kind of per vertical, right? So the I don't know, Open Collective New Zealand, for example, our entity in New Zealand, kind of does the first layer of compliance for all New Zealand collectives and things like that, right? So you have that you have someone on the ground um, first. Um, 
open source collective does other compliance to GitHub and you know checking that the projects exist, that they have community, the project history, and all of that. Stuff. So there's like one layer like that. And then there's another layer that is like platform level um, compliance or fraud detection. There we have a ton of things that we use um, and that we build ourselves, or we use services like Zip or things like that. And then we also rely on um, fraud detection from Stripe and so as all our payment providers, right? So it's kind of multi, multi layer. But I will return to the ethics, sorry, that uh, you can control with the NGO that this person is a valid person, he, she, they exist and there is a certain legacy and but when we talk about ethical things like because people could steal to stuff but they behave unethical how do you ensure that there is a synchronicity yeah and what and what kind of ethics are important for you beyond helping marginalize because kind of this what's the, behind it like what's the, the ethic is kind of like impact and not the the, the, the just the, the way yeah so um, on, we, we can't obviously be in the rooms where everyone is doing things. Um, so we trust by default, that's kind of how we operate. But we also have, and this is not something that we did in the past, this is something from the past kind of year or, or 18 months. We do a lot of more human support to the communities that we host. And this is, we were always just financially, you know, a financial tool, like, until very recently. Um, and now we have a whole team that works supporting communities with conflict resolution, um, with governance issues. And that is something that is very costly and very onerous for us, because like, the more you automate, the, you know, the lower your costs. But we've, we've reached that level where we can't keep growing and scaling unless we, we really invest in kind of the human aspect of, of the collective. And so we, we are building inside each of the nonprofits, we're building small teams that are dedicated to, to this. We do not enforce code of conduct or anything like I mean on the platform, yes of course, but like on, on this meetup for example, we do be enforcing a code of conduct. Right? But if there's like an alert from someone who came to the meetup, before we could handle that, and now we can. Right. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. I think that's it for the. <laughs>